This is the second session in our series on the path to salvation. Today, our agenda is about faith, about what is faith and how is it awakened. We're going to cover how we can know God, the difference between energy and the essence of God. We'll also give some a few thoughts about how we nurture faith. And finally, the doctrine of synergia, how it's important that we cooperate with our will and with God's uh, grace. So the main points that we will cover is first that faith is based on an experience of God. It's not based on some intellectual understanding that we might get from reading a book like the Bible. We may start with that, but there's more than that. It has to be based on this experience. And this true faith with experience then leads to grace being given to us by God. And this grace is the uncreated energies of God. Then grace is what then empowers us to align our will to do God's work. These are the main points we're going to try to cover. So faith is necessary to do what God has outlined for us. His commandments are impossible to live without some kind of spiritual transformation. And this is a transformation that comes through grace. We need the grace of God to be able to live the way he has indicated for us. This has to be our first priority. Not doing, we're going to try the best we can, but we're not going to be able to do until we deal with attaining the grace of God. And it's faith that draws us God's grace that allows grace to be active within us. And then God's grace builds our faith even more. So it's a dynamic process, an ongoing process, that our faith is constantly deepening, expanding, and our ability to do God's will constantly grows. So without faith, without this true faith that we're talking about here, there can be no salvation because we only experience our separation from God. So as we talked last time, the main aim of a Christian has to be union with God. It's more than just doing his good works. We can't just be good people. Our aim has to be to have this personal union with God where we experience his grace. And this way begins with this faith we're talking about. And with faith, we're going to find zeal that enables us to do all kinds of things. Here's how Paul says it. He says, examine yourselves. See whether you are holding to your faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Remember we talked last time how the Spirit, God, is within us? This is what Christ told us, what Paul keeps telling us. And we have to realize this God that's within us and open our heart to experience that, then grace will be able to flow through us so we can do his will. Here's how St. Theophon the Recluse puts it. He says, Christian life is zeal and the strength to remain in communion with God by means of an active fulfillment of his holy will, according to our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and with the help of grace of God to the glory of his most holy name. So faith involves this inner knowing of God, which leads to zeal, which attracts, allows, opens up grace to flow within us. And with this grace comes all the power that's necessary to carry out his commandments, to do his will. So what is faith anyway? Is this something we blindly accept? Is it something we do because our spouse wants us to believe what she believes? Is it something we do because of our ethnic or cultural background, our tradition of our society around us? Is it something we develop through some philosophical or logical scheme, some analysis of 
biblical teachings as an example. Is this something we get by reading the Bible or other books? Well, maybe it starts that way, huh? What does faith mean to you? What kind of faith do you feel that you have? In the Greek, the Greek word is pisti. It's used over 240 times in the New Testament. And its meaning is to remain steadfast, unwavering loyalty. Unwavering loyalty is what pisti, which is translated as faith, means. To remain steadfast. Paul tells us it's the assurance of things hoped for. The assurance, right? The conviction of things not seen. This is what faith is. It's not just, it's, I understand. I read it and I, I understand. I, I, I sort of could accept all that. No, it's not that. It's something much more. What does unwaveringly loyalty mean? It's like some kind of certainty in that, right? Some kind of commitment. When we have this true faith, then we experience zeal. We get zeal. We get energy. So what is this zeal, anyway? What, is, what do I mean by zeal? Jesus, like, Jesus likens it to fire. He says, I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. And then he also says, for everyone will be seasoned with fire. This is what zeal is. It's like fire burning within us. Fire that we want to be so close to God that he, we, he didn't feel his embrace and he's helping us do everything that he has taught us. And we are struggling and striving to be just like him. With fire, with zeal. Paul says, he also calls, uh, puts it like fire. He says, do not put out the Spirit's fire. He says, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Okay, he says, put out the spirits. Do not put out the spirits' fire. We have spirit. We have fire. He says, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching towards those things which are ahead. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ. So like those things that are behind, what we experienced before, and now I've got a new insight. A new relationship. And now I'm going to press towards that goal of being becoming like him. He also advises us to pursue all with our effort, with all our effort to, to gain this goal. He says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? But one receives the prize. Run with such a way that you may obtain it. We must have that energy to run, to be the winner, to be the victor. Remember, Christ also told us it's a narrow gate, right, that we're going to get into this paradise in eternal life. St. Theophan advises the following. He says, in Christian life, the result of the fervor of zeal is a certain quickness, a liveliness of spirit, in which people undertake God-pleasing works. We don't do it out of obligation. We do it with liveliness of spirit, trampling upon oneself, setting aside our own needs, and willingly offering as a sacrifice to God every kind of labor without sparing oneself. So how is this kind of faith developed? It only comes from an inner experience of God's grace. It's not intellectual. So, when you think of this, what, what does this mean, this inner experience? I remember last time we talked a lot about how God dwells within. Paul says, for you are the temple of the living God. We're the temple of the living, living God, as we are. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. In Revelations, Jesus says about himself, he says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. So, do I hear the voice? Do I knock? Am I standing at the door? 
Paul says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? This indwelling of God is not something mental, but it's a living and an enlivening kind of thing. Now, the mental efforts that we make are important, but they're only a means. Our mental efforts allow us to implement what God's will is. But they can block us. We can be so strong in our own mental ideas and attitudes and thinking that we're blocking out the Word of God that's in us and working through us, that we miss, miss it entirely. <clears throat> Paul tells us, Work out your own salvation with fear, trembling, for it is God who works in you. See, we keep coming back to this in you part. God is in us. That's what we have to work with. That's what we have to be in contact. That's what we have to know. So ask yourself, how do you experience this power that's within? Do you experience it? Do you tap it? Are you working with it? Are you ignoring it? How do you experience it? We also know that God is a mystery. And Paul, through Paul, we know that his essence is unknowable. He says, God dwells in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen or can see. He also tells us that our knowledge is always incomplete. He says, for now we see through a glass darkly, for I know in part. So we have knowledge of God only to the extent that he has revealed it to us. And he reveals it to us in a very special way because he's within us. So about knowing God, what's the problem? If God is unknowable, how are we going to know him? How do we obtain this faith that's based on experience if he's unknowable? Well, there's a key doctrine of the church that really makes this very clear for us. And there's a difference between God's essence and his energies. We must distinguish between them, between his essence and his energies. And the analogy is the sun and its rays. We can look at the, feel the sun, right? We can see the rays of the sun coming. We can feel its warmth. But what's happening in the sun, we do not know. Something far removed from us. Same with fire. We can stand in front of a fire and we feel that, that warmth shining from it. We can see the light coming from it. But what's inside, what's making it burn and all that, we can't see. We don't know what's going on there. Same with essence of God and his energies. We can experience God through his energies. And all of this is really God himself. It's all. There's just one. There's not two things here. He is outside all things according to his essence, but in all things through his acts of power, says St. Athanasius. And both of these are the uncreated reality of God. And we believe in his essence because we experience his energy. We know there's something behind the energy that we experience. Even though we can't know his essence, we definitely can experience his energy. And so with the right preparation, the right opening of our hearts, we can know God directly through the energies. So the essence is the transcendent nature of God. And his energies are his eminence and his omnipresence. Here's what Callistos Ware, a modern theologian, tells us. He says, The Godhead is simple and indivisible and has no parts. The essence signifies the whole God as he is in himself. The energies signify the whole God as he is in action. God in his entirety is completely present in each of his divine energies. So we're not experiencing a part of God. We're experiencing God himself when we experience his energies. Here's St. Basil the Great puts it this way. He says, The energies are numerous and the essence of God simple. And what we know when we say God is in fact his energies. We do not presume to approach his essence. His energies come down to us, but his essence remains beyond our reach. So, ask yourselves, how do you experience God's energies? 
Now we're going to talk about now about zeal. And with energy, his energies, we come, it's this fire of zeal, right? This fire burning within us. So in summary, faith is based on an inner experience of God's grace or his energies. It involves an unwavering commitment, idea of peace, right? Coupled with zeal. And leads to a way of life within the church and its mysteries. We, we just desire with great energy to participate in all the mysteries which are the work of the Holy Spirit. And our soul and our body become aligned towards God with faith. This is our natural condition, the way we were created from the discussion we had previously on creation. This is what we gain through this true faith. You probably are seeking more about what this means, faith. Because most of us have a, a shallow faith, you might say, that's one based on, oh, I, I believe. I, it makes sense to me. It's that's, uh, uh, that's something I can accept. But it's much more than that, right? It's based on this experience, which is something much more deep. Remember the story Jesus told about the mustard seed? He said, if you have faith as small as this tiny mustard seed shown here, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Nothing will be impossible with faith. But it's got to be this faith that's experienced with God that brings this divine grace that gives us energy to do what God wills for us. It can't be just a simple intellectual understanding. So how are we going to nurture this development, this faith, development of this true faith, this deep faith, this peace? Thing? Or we could ask ourselves, how do we acquire zeal? It's necessary for Orthodox Christian life. How do we get the energy to want to do all these things? To be there in church all the time. To be participating in the sacraments of church. To do the fasting, prayer, daily prayer, and all those things that are laid out for us in the Orthodox way of life. How do we get the zeal for that? How do we nurture this faith development? Well, Starting point, we accept that we are not searching for a definition that can be put in words or a mental image. We recognize we're not seeking a philosophy that logically explains everything. These are mysteries and it comes through experience. The mystery is no longer a mystery once we experience it. We seek a feeling that's within our heart, that something is tied to a loving relationship with God. We experience His love. And in turn, we experience wanting to love Him with our whole heart. It comes from within the heart. We seek to be wakened from some kind of slumber. We'll realize how asleep we are once we experience it. That's induced by our earthly way of living, our earthly comforts, our beautiful homes, our beautiful transportation, our great abundance of food, and... Oh, the pride that we have, that we are responsible for everything. The reality. Truth, no. Reality. Most of us have chosen to separate ourselves from God. You may not think that you made this choice, but that's the truth. That God is within us, and he's available to us whenever we choose to open our heart and let him work through us. There is an awakening of divine grace that's important. St. Theophon puts it this way. Awakening is that act of divine grace where we see our sinfulness. When we wake up to this, when we have this experience, our sinfulness becomes obvious. We sense the danger then of our situation. We begin to fear for ourselves and, and to care about deliverance from our misfortune and salvation. This is this idea of fear of God that comes to us. We want to be different. We realize how much work now we have to do. We see ourselves in a different way. We've been illumined. 
and our sinfulness comes to the surface. So we realize that we're separated from God. That's the reality for almost all of us. What are the indicators, indications of this separation? Well, when our own well-being is our main focus of life, this is the primary one. That that's what we're working on. That's our main effort. God is somewhere in the distance. We can look at our busyness, our activities, our striving, our pleasure-seeking. And the fact that it no longer really gives us satisfaction. Once we encounter one pleasure, it goes away. We seek another. We have one outing, and we have fun, and it goes away. We seek another, do another. It goes on and on, right? We're striving. Striving for more pay, for more activity. We're busy. Our lives are filled with busyness. But yet, underlying all this busyness, all these activities, all this striving, we have a haunting anxiety that there's something more. There's something more. We don't know what it is. But we just sense that something's not quite right. We're continually seeking new activities, purchasing new clothes, new gadgets, and so on and so on. We're looking for new sensations, right? Another vacation, whatever it may be, some other way to get pleasure, to get some kind of satisfaction. We do it, it goes away. We have to do it again. And we may be seeking self-help classes. We may feel this angst, may feel tension, we may feel stress and so forth. And seek these classes of whatever may be, whether it be yoga or anything else, some way that's seeking to give some some release from this. But still, underlying uh, is some of this anxiety that exists. And each time we engage, even in self-help classes, again, next time, we'll seek another one and a different one and so forth. We haven't found the answer. And most importantly, we'll find that we face problems in our relationships. We find there's people that we don't like, that we can't deal with. Because we don't have love. We don't have the kind of love that Christ had. There was no one he couldn't deal with. So we have problems in our relationships, whether it be very close ones like our spouses or our children or our co-workers and so forth. These are all symptoms. These are all indicators of our separation from God. So we need to ask ourselves, how do we nurture faith that's going to lift us above all this? Well, first, we have to open our hearts recognize the condition that we're in, that we are separated from God, that our soul is in danger. And the reality is, you know the story of the prodigal son, we are him. We have left the father. We have gone off to another land to seek our better way of being, our earthly way of being, right? And now he's waiting for us with open arms to accept our return. And when he returns, he's going to throw a banquet. And he's going to give us this grace that's going to change our lives and give us bring zeal that's going to bring him closer to, to him. So God is trying to awaken us to the reality of our insignificance and our self-centeredness. He's constantly working on trying to help us, trying to bring us back into his kingdom. But we are the ones that choose to separate. Here's St. Theophon again. He says, An instantaneous destruction of the whole order of our willful and sinful life. And we have an awakening. This is what's going to take place. And simultaneously, it's going to be the revelation before our consciousness of another divine order which is the one true and spiritually soothing order, that which partakes of the peace of Christ. So this awakening as we experience God, with this direct experience, as we begin to see His grace, it's going to destroy our whole order. We're going to see the nature of our life and what's wrong with it. And we're going to want to change. We're going to seek, be able to seek forgiveness and help from Him to change and participate in the sacraments and life of the Church. So when you have this awakening, 
this experience. At first, it may feel like something that's just greater than yourself. You may not know exactly what it is. And you begin to realize some higher purpose in life, something more than what you thought was the purpose of your life. Something more to do with divine, something with a life beyond. And you're going to feel this nudging in your heart. It's going to be tugging on you. It's going to be a warm spot there is going to be developing. And then you begin to believe in a higher power. This higher power becomes starts to become real to you because it's coming from within your heart where God lives in us. And as it becomes coupled in with the good news of Jesus Christ, we're going to join with him in his church. If we're not already part of the church, we'll be drawn to a church to be with him, to nurture that feeling, that experience that we're having within. So grace ignites our heart and then begins to give us this zeal, this energy that makes us one to change our way of being, to look at ourselves and the reality of our life compared to the ideal that Christ has laid down to it that we can read about in the Gospels. And as this grace ignites, we can say that we have faith. This is when we can have faith. So how do we nurture this awakening? We can observe God in creation, we can read about God in Scripture and, holy, and understand it through holy tradition and the teachings of the fathers. It can be a revelation, like we've been talking to, like Paul, who just all of a sudden he had this great revelation on the way to Damascus. We can experience in the church the sacraments of the church, or by visiting holy people who have this insight and give us some understanding or self knowledge, seeing ourself, exploring within ourselves, and suffering is another one. And the first there, observing creation. And as Paul says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. In other words, we can see God through creation. He's, there's all this world that man had nothing to do with. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead. So walking through nature, undisturbed by man, we can find ourselves awakened to this inner existence of God, this energy that's everywhere, and we can find it within our own heart. Or we can discover it also through sacred scripture and sacred tradition. And we find there that through seeing the incarnation of the Son of God, God came to earth and showed himself to us, gave us the model of what we are to become. We know that the Son of God has come and he has given us an understanding that we may know the true God as John tells us. Paul, he tells us that faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes by the Word of God. So the Word of God can also open our hearts. If we're reading Scripture the right way, not analytically, but more prayerfully, open our hearts for that Word to speak through our heart, through our being, through our inner being, because this Word of God can penetrate deep within us and help us see this divine order of things. But we have to let go of this intellectual analysis of our reading. And of course, the direct experience of God, this is the most simplest. And maybe it doesn't happen quite as like it did to Paul for many people, but sometimes he will appear to us. And when this does, it leads to this dissatisfaction with what's happening around us and leads us again to change as our limitations become very vivid, very clear when we have this. And this is true with all the kind, different kinds of waking that we may get uh, from maybe these other methods as well. So our seeking increases. We develop this zeal again. The church, was through mysteries of baptism, we may have been baptized and fallen away, and then all of a sudden we begin tending church again. And we find the hymns, and the prayers, and then our participation in the sacraments as we prepare through fasting and so forth. We go to confession and we find an insight there. In Holy Communion, we know that we're now in touch with God. 
or holy unction. Or we may have visited a monastery and talked with a holy person who could see into our soul and then knew the right thing to tell us that lifted us above. This is one thing I experienced of being going to a monastery. Every time I would go, the abbess would tell me a miracle story because she knew that deep within me, I did not believe in miracles. Sure enough, after a period of time, it took a long time, she had great patience with me. And she would always come up with a new story. One day Christ came to me. I had this direct experience. And he says, Charlie, why don't you believe in my miracles? From that tight on, time on, zeal was with me. And I had the energy to go and begin to do something, explore my inner being the way I was, and begin to experience his divine grace and begin to grow in, in a significant way. Suffering, that's another way. A lot of people come to God when they something is lost. They lose their strength. They lose their power. They lose their wealth. They lose their friends. And they experience the death of a loved one. Then they begin to search. What is this? What's happening? My world has been thrown up in turmoil. It's been thrown. What I thought was under control isn't under control. Where do I turn? So in that opening, God will still be there. So if God, if you're open, God's going to try to comfort you through his grace again. And as you experience this comfort of God himself, you are enlightened, you are awakened, and then begin to zeal then to further this effort to nurture this faith in a deep way. So what's the truth? The truth is, without this deep, true faith, accompanied with the zeal that it brings, you cannot go any further. This is our first priority. This is what we must start with. Seeking this faith, seeking this Holy Spirit, seeking this divine grace, developing this zeal, so we can continue on the path towards being united with Him. And this is a mistake that we see in much of Western Christianity because it's focused on an intellectual understanding. You analyze and analyze, read this and understand this and look up this and look up and so on. It's all intellectual. And you're focused on giving to charity and doing good things, thinking that's going to bring it. But no, we have to do more than just doing good things. We have to do good things out of God's will rather than our own will. So first, priority has got to be to seek Faith, this deep faith, this divine grace. Because what God has commanded for us is impossible without this deep faith that brings us divine grace. We've got to have that first. So, to do his commandments requires that we focus on developing grace that works in us continually. And this is the priority in our Orthodox faith. This is what we're asking everyone to focus on first. Is only then can you do, truly do, the will of God. And with faith, which brings zeal, we're going to turn our whole being to God. And we're going to become united with Him and His will. And we're going to enter into a new dynamic relationship with God because God, excuse me, the God is going to be working within and then acting through us. We're going to become truly his servants, his sons. It's going to become real. And we're going to become aware of our sinfulness and then desire his help to change our whole way to life. Big, big things. Big things can happen. But it's faith first. It's not faith alone. It's faith first. Because with first faith, we can begin to become his servant. 
with this deep faith, this true faith, based on an actual experience with God. But faith alone is not enough. Here's what James says clearly. You see then that a man is justified by works, not only by faith only. So this faith as we develop and as we develop this inner relationship, we're called to do what he wills us to do. We can't ignore that dimension of it. And nowhere in the scripture does it say we are justified by faith alone. We can't just have this experience and then sit there and think it's okay. No, we have to now use that energy to do his work. We have to become his servant, the God's servant carrying out his will in this world. As Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. It's God who works in you once we are open with this faith. This is what we are called to do and must do once we have faith. As he also says, as workers together with him. Okay, this workers together is an important idea. We call this synergia. This is a key doctrine of the church. It's like the mother of God who gave, said okay when the angel came to her and told her she was going to be that God was going to give her the even pregnant her with the Son of God. And she says, let it be unto his will. She agreed. So we have to do the same thing. We have to cooperate with God. We have to cooperate with this divine grace that we're going to receive. Synergia. It's not being it's not something that's between equals, but a finite man working with the Almighty God. It's not about earning salvation, but about this cooperating with grace. We're not thinking we're going to do work and then gain salvation. No, we're only following God's will. We're only exercising the grace that's given to us. We're letting our light shine to the whole world so it can be enlightened and join with us in our love of God. Synergia. It all begins with faith. And with this faith comes God's grace. And then with our will and synergia, we're joined together uh, with love. Love for God and our neighbors. And then we can live the Orthodox life. We can live what God has commanded for us. And this is going to lead us towards theosis and our salvation through the synergia. Don't forget, it all begins with this deeper faith that I've been talking about. Now we could choose just to act out of our own will with our worldly life, but what's the result of that? Yeah, it's right, it's a bunch of question marks. There is no answer. There's no satisfaction in the end. That, in the end, only comes through our salvation, our uniting with God, to be united with Him, to have that eternal life, because we know for certainty death will come. And what's beyond that? Is that it? We can put our worldly treasures in our coffin, carry that with us? No. There's a whole new life. The true meaning of life is something more than what we think of this worldly life. The life that Christ is talking about is the life that leads us forever. It's a life that lives forever. That's what salvation is about. So, it is first God's mercy, His grace, not our effort, which saves us. It's God leading us. And then with repentance, it's based on the faith. We are granted more of His mercy if through His divine grace. And as Paul says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So remember, this is all initiated by God. He's there. He wants us to knock and open the door, and He is within, and He will help us. He will join with us so we can join our will with His to be like him and to do his work 
as his servant. So our works, after we've been awakened and come to God and work on uh, bringing ourselves in the orthodox way of life, it becomes all about love. As, as Christ said, the things that seem so hard. He says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Easy to say. But without God, it's difficult, if not impossible, to do. John, it says also in John, if we love one another, God abides in us. It's true. We can practice love and God's energies are increased. His, his grace is increased. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. That's why love is all powerful. He who says he abides in him ought also to walk just as he walked. We've got to become like him and walk like he walked, as shown in the stories in the, in the gospel stories. True faith is demonstrated by the way we live, and the way we live then also strengthens our faith. So this orthodox way of life that we're going to be talking about is a life that's based on faith and the seeking of this union with Christ to become one with him, to become united with him. And in the process, accepting his gift of grace and mercy and cooperating with it and with this zeal that we gain from this, this energy that we, we will uh, have. And this leads us to a life of repentance. We begin to see our sinfulness. We're awakened to the reality of the way we are in relationship to how God uh, expects us to be and what we can become. Metanya is a change in the way of thinking. This is what repentance is. It's not just uh, admitting I broke a law, broke a rule. No, no, no. It's something much deeper than that. It's about seeing in a positive way, once we see what we lack, it's a positive thing. Because now we know, with God's help, we can change and we can become something greater, more like Him. And so this life of repentance is this constant process of seeking what and what ways He can help us to become more like Him. It's a way of life that's guided and supported by the sacraments of the Church. So all the sacraments, the reason Christ gave us the church was so we could heal and follow this life of repentance and constantly be nurtured through the Holy Spirit and the holy sacraments of the church. And the primary ones are confession, holy confession, and holy communion. So we participate with zeal. We joyfully come to those. We come to church early. And we can hear the prayers and prepare ourselves to receive Christ in holy communion, to be with him, to ask for his forgiveness to nurture our soul. And then we live a life of love and compassion through grace. Grace is love. And with His grace, our life becomes a life of love and compassion. So it's kind of like this. Our natural condition in paradise was where everything was in union. God working through the soul, controlling the body, with Christ at our center in our heart. That's our natural condition. The reality after the fall and how we exist today is that we find ourselves separated from God where our body and through our brain is in control and intellectually we try to control everything, figure everything out ourselves, use our free will according to our own will, even though we still have this image of God existing within us. But God is still out there. He's somewhere else. When in reality, He's been given to us inside. So, as we experience God, we gain His grace, then we cooperate with it and we grow. We become something more. We move towards this likeness of God, towards the potential that we have for our salvation and theosis, this union with God. We can experience this eternal life with Him beyond death, forever and ever, in His kingdom, in paradise.